I'm Timothy Walton, and I'm a senior fellow in our Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. And we're here this morning to discuss aerial refueling. It's one of the US military's most important strategic advantages, but it's one that adversaries, in particular the People's Republic of China, are working to counter. Um, and unless the Department of Defense starts to change, what, what has historically been a strategic strength could become a weakness. Uh, to discuss this area, um, so the future plans for the aerial refueling fleet and some of the congressional oversight over the aerial refueling enterprise, we're joined by an illustrious panel of experts, um, starting uh, to my left, you're right here, is J.J. Gertler, who's been of one of Washington's top aerospace experts for decades. He spent a long time on the Hill as a staffer and then at the Congressional Research Service where he authored innumerable reports on air forces. He's now um, wearing a few different hats, a teal group at the Center for Strategic and International Studies where he's a fellow. He also co-hosts a, a podcast on the Defense and Aerospace Report along with Bago Maradian and he founded the Direct, uh, the Defense Concepts Organization where he consults for the aerospace industry. Um, he recently joined us now from pa the Paris Air Show where he may have some insights on that subject as well. Lots of tanking there. Thanks. Um, John Ludwigensen is a director in the Government Accountability Office's Contracting and National Security Acquisitions team. In the over two decades he's spent at GAO, he's worked not only on the defense side, uh, but also in the natural resources um, team, and more, more recently now, he oversees work spanning a variety of areas, including on weapon systems acquisition, research and development programs, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, Army acquisition, and certainly aerial refueling and tankers. And then lastly, Tom Sharpie uh, retired last year from the U.S. Air Force as a Lieutenant General, and during his storied career, he was Vice Commander of the 18th Air Force, Deputy Commander of the Air Mobility Command, and Deputy Chief of Staff for Capability Development at NATO Allied Command Transformation. He now continues to inform leaders in the air mobility enterprise as owner of the Sharpie Group. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me all this morning. Um, I'd like to start with you, JJ, if I could. Um, you spent a lot of time on the Hill and, and had the experience to witness the evolution and in shape in many ways, uh, I think, where we, we've gotten in terms of the air mobility enterprise. Could you shed some insights on what were the, some of the major developments in the past couple decades, and maybe what are factors that we should keep in mind as Congress and policymakers consider the path ahead? Well, sure, Tim. This is where the bad flashbacks begin. Uh, the modern tanker enterprise really took form in the wake of 9-11. Quite famously, the, there was an attempt to lease tankers for the United States Air Force. And while that didn't wind up happening, let's take the acquisition process out of it and just look at what the plans were. There was a plan to replace the KC-135 and KC-10 fleets with three tranches of aircraft. The first, called KC-X, was to be 179 new tankers. The second, called KC-Y, was to look around toward the end of KCX, see if anything had changed in the tanking landscape, but the presumption was that would be another 179 of whatever you bought for KCX, unless there was some significant competition. And the third, called KC KCZ, rather, was an entirely different tanker. It was notionally the replacement for the KC-10, greater capacity, a more strategically oriented uh, aircraft. Those plans have all completely changed, and, but they changed in various stages. The first was there was, after several abortive competitions, a KCX award. We are now partway through delivery of that first 179. Over time, though, there became a different emphasis on KCZ the third, the big, what had been conceived of as the big tanker. About seven or eight years ago, AMC started talking about it as a new technology tanker, not necessarily defined by its size, but defined by other capabilities such as stealth. Because that happened, KCY, the middle tanker, started to be thought of as a bridge from KCX to the future tanker. It was originally, at least, still 179 aircraft, 
but it was less about building a big fleet to replace all the KC-135s than making sure we had enough tanker capacity until a more ambitious mm -hmm. ACZ could be developed and come along. Most re there have been a number of steps in between, but most recently, while KCX still looks pretty much the same, KCY is being thought of as a bridge tanker, but because KCZ is no longer a big strategic tanker, there's been some question as to whether KCY should fill in some of that capability. So there, there was a plan to compete KCY between the Boeing KC-46 and Lockheed allied with Airbus presenting what they call their LMXT, the Lockheed Martin Strategic Tanker X apparently stands for strategic now. But the uh, Air Force most recently has said, we don't really want to compete that. We don't need to have an yet another aircraft type and all the overhead and basing implications that come with it. So we're inclined to just buy more KC-46s. Mm -hmm. That was bad news for Lockheed Martin, at least on the face of it. But it was also bad news for Boeing, because Boeing had bid so low on the original KC-46 in order to get the business that that program has been running at a significant deficit to them. They had expected to make that money up by building the second 179, where they had all the bugs worked out and all the learning curve done. Now that's going to be 75 aircraft on which they have to attempt to make back whatever they've lost on the first 179. And now we have a replacement for KCZ called NGAS, the Next Generation Air Refueling System. It's not specifically defined yet. Requests for information have gone out to industry saying, what do you got? What do you think this should look like? But that's a program that's still somewhere off in the future. And now we have an asterisk which is a possible fourth tanker. The Air Force has been performing experiments and moving toward a concept that's called agile combat environment, where they are trying, employment. or employment, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. Where they're trying to deploy to smaller, more austere bases. The kinds of bases they're thinking about are very rarely happily located next to a deep draft port where a tanker ship can pull in with pipelines going to the airfield to deliver fuel. So they're now looking at ways to deliver fuel by air to support these austere airfields. The Air Force has been doing experiments with cargo planes carrying fuel bladders, but we've now seen L3 Harris get together with Embraer to boost their KC-390 tanker, which is a much smaller tanker on the order of C-130 sized, focused on taking fuel forward to bases like this. So there may be yet another tanker in our future. We don't know yet. It's a great start, JJ, thank you. Um, Tom, can I get you to jump in a little bit? On, you spent some time at AMC and had some perspective on that evolution in the thinking. Yeah, I mean, come on the heels of sequestration, you know, we had to make some hard decisions, some hard choices on um, recapitalization and prioritization of what Air, the needs the Air Force are and what those requirements were. And so, you know, originally it was a recapitalization for KCX, the three-tiered acquisition program, as you mentioned, X, Y, and Z. And originally that was recapped to 135 as X, and that became KC-46. And then it was a decision of coming out of sequestration, um, how do we get after Y and then Z? So we started going after the KC-46, and then when we looked at Y and Z, we made some decisions to divest the KC-10 due to the bills we had to pay to get after other Air Force priorities. And, and so then they decided that um, um, we needed to go back and take that R&D money for KCY, which was in the budget that we took out again to pay another bill. And so when we were at Scott and we were looking at it, we were trying to figure out, okay, how do we go from X, Y, and Z? We can't afford it. When you looked at what Y and Z was gonna be, if it was a commercial off the shelf -ish available tanker, the acquisition professional said 10 to 15 years to procure and to deliver. And if it was gonna be a non-developmental tanker where you had to clean sheet, it was gonna be 15 to 25 years. And if you did the math, KC-46 was supposed to end its delivery in 28. And then if at the time it was 15, 16, 17, 18, in those years, 15 years or 25 years, we didn't have enough time to be able to do Y and Z. And so there was a decision to consider, let's put a wedge into the, into the FIDAP 
uh, after eight, outside of the fight up into 28 to be able to go for a five-year increment, which then became, as JJ said, the bridge tanker. And so that's where, you know, I think there was put in for like 60 at the time to put in there so that we could continue producing because we couldn't afford to have a gap. Mm -hmm. That's what we knew. We couldn't afford to have a gap. And so, you know, it was to go from X to Z. And then Z was, um, my, my memory served was, we were trying to build a purpose-built tanker. That's what Z was. Whether it was big, large, or small, or tactical, that had yet to be determined, but it was going to be a purpose-built tanker because if you look at history of air refueling, you know, most of, the, most of our tankers are commercial, and then we, we uh, derive them to be a tanker. And so this was going to be the first attempt, I thought, at the time to build a purpose-built tanker. And so that's kind of how we got there. It's really helpful. I'd love to get your perspective also on, you know, one of the recent developments that now we're facing is the KC-10 fleet is being divested, right? Perhaps uh, later this year, or no later than 2024, the KC-10 fleet should be completely out of U.S. Air Force service. How is, is that shift going to, I think, change air operations? How will Air Mobility Command need to uh, adjust to, to address that? Because it does have a, a very unique capability in terms of high capacity, high, high offload. Yeah, I mean, KC-10, I go, I go back as Lieutenant Sharpie during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, flying KC-135A models. You know, we'd go up with our offloads, and, and when we'd get done refueling, they'd say, go consolidate to the KC-10, and the KC-10 would stay on station. It had a, a large offload, as you're as you well aware, had strategic distances and could carry a lot of cargo. Um, but the KC-10, it wasn't about the capacity that we lost. It was more about the expense and the cost it was doing for flying hour and the availability of spare parts. And so, you know, I think that KC-X was originally a 135 replacement, Y and Z, with that KC-10 now being out of the mix, you know, the, our Air Force and our DOD has to figure out what are we trying to replace? Is it about, is it about efficiency or effectiveness? Mm -hmm. Is it about offloads or is it about booms in the air? Mm -hmm. And I think we could have a debate all day about each and every one of those because there's pros and cons of both of those. Mm -hmm. But in this, you know, this uh, combat employment area that we're trying to get into, it's got to be a combination of all of the above, right? And, and there's a lot of things that you've had in some of your reports that talk about there's other ways to help with the refueling problem that we have specifically in a specific theater about doing other things to robust basing and to get access to fuels and other things like that. But at the end of the day, it's got to come down to the Air Force with OSD's guidance and obviously political oversight on what is the best trade space to be able to provide the best capacity to ensure that our warfighters have the best capability when they need it. And so instead of requirements, I use the word capability requirements. What do we need and how can we get after that? And what are those trade spaces with those options that are available to help provide the greatest capability for the most reasonable dollar because we don't have an unlimited budget? Thanks, Tom. Um, let's save some of the NGAS rounds for a little bit later if we could, but, but, I th but I'm already sensing it's going to be a rich discussion. Um, John, if I can get you to jump in a little bit, please, on uh, you and your colleagues have published some incisive reports on contracting and sustainment best practices, and, and one in particular focused on the KC-46 a few years ago. What were some of the conclusions of that report, and, and I think maybe lessons for continued management of the KC-46 program and, and future programs? Sure. Yeah, in 2019, we issued a report uh, on the KC-46 program, and, and we were looking at it from a contracting perspective because it was still a developmental program. At the time we started that, uh, that work that led to the 2019 report, we expected that it was going to be a very short window before uh, it was going to be completed with development and moved into um, del just delivery of air vehicles, right? So we, we started out thinking, hey, this is going to be a good time. We're going to be able to look at this program that was pretty, we thought, insightfully set up and was on a pretty good trajectory. Um, as it turns out, we were reporting on uh, an aircraft that uh, was being uh, a program that was being delivered with uh, below expected costs, which is always good news from GAO's perspective. Um, but it was also being delivered late, right? So um, you can have it. What, what's the rule of thumb for engineers? <laughs> you can have it uh, good, cheap, or fast. Mm -hmm. Choose two. Uh, and so it was. They expected it was going to meet all the requirements. They expected uh, it was going to be under cost. I think around nine million dollars uh, or nine billion dollars. Sorry. Uh, uh, per, for the program at the time. And that turned out to be sort of the beginning of the story, not the end of the story. So we, but at that point in 2019, when we issued the report, we found there were several good things about the program. Uh, it was a commercial derivative program. It uh, was, as you may recall, uh, 
767 with a 787 cockpit, if I'm remembering correctly, yep. in, in electronics that was combined. They put a, a cargo door in. Uh, Boeing ended up with a, a, an air vehicle that they could sell for cargo. And then it was, went through the militarization process to result in the KC-46. Uh, and that was capable of, a very capable aircraft in terms of being able to carry a, a good amount of fuel, being able to, to execute a lot of mission. Uh, had great aspirations from uh, the old days, as you may recall, where the, the person flying the booms maybe laying on their belly in some of the old variety of, of aircraft. And this was going to be an upright, uh, camera-oriented uh, del fuel delivery system for the boom for the operator, uh, and that's where the wheels started to come off the wagon. So the RVS, as it was called, um, turned out to be challenged at that point. We didn't know how challenged when we issued the report. And at the end of the report, we were highlighting aspects of the program that we thought were lessons learned that other programs could kind of grow from. And from our perspective, um, writing, writing that, uh, that program from the beginning as a commercial derivative that they were gonna build uh, from what they thought were mature technologies, implement this with a firm fixed price contract, uh, and being able to deliver these in what we thought was pretty reasonable timeframes, uh, pre-negotiated pricing out through uh, the term of the program. Uh, those were all very good things. We identified aspects of the contract that we thought were well done, things like the corrections of deficiencies clause turned out to be, we'll talk about that when we get to the 2022 report, <laughs> but that, uh, essentially obligated Boeing to uh, pay for the technology uh, upgrades that were needed in order to meet the requirements and any retrofit costs that were going to be needed in order to deliver that, that product to the warfighter. Uh, we, there were some boom stiffness issues that were the responsibility of the government, uh, as it turns out, but the, the aspects of that contract were really in the sort of big picture uh, pretty well considered from what we thought, and we thought it was important uh, to propagate those lessons to other programs that were considering commercial derivative type aircraft. And uh, we recommended that they move forward and, and propagate those lessons across the Air Force and, and to others. And so that was, um, it, while it wasn't an all good news story uh, from a GAO perspective, because it was, it was late and there were some deficiencies that were still being worked through, it was sort of a forward looking appeared to be on the right track and an, an instance where the government could learn something and maybe grow from it. John, if I could follow up, um, one of the themes that I guess emerged from that report is firm fixed price contracting and, right. and thinking about when it's appropriate. Uh, recently, there's been some industry pushback against that and maybe on some parts of the government as well. Um, L3 Harris's CEO, Chris Kubasek, mentioned in June that um, his company was no longer going to be bidding on firm fixed price contracts where the specifications um, were not defined. It's not clear what exactly that means, but overall, all three Harris is like 70% of its government contracts are now firm fixed price, and I think they're addressing that, especially amidst inflation. Uh, Boeing also has a significant portion of its uh, air contracts as firm fixed price, and it might seem like there's this general theme of pushing back against firm fixed price. In your sort of analysis and with your GAO colleagues, in what cases is it most appropriate to use firm fixed price contracts and where not? And encourage the other two of you to jump in, please. Yeah, I think from our perspective, firm fixed price is an option. It's not, uh, it's not the best option in all circumstances. I think um, the case where firm fixed price makes the most sense is when it's a mature technology, uh, it's a, a, a known sort of picture of what the risks are that look to be present. And you're positioning, in a firm fixed price contract, you're positioning the contractor to manage the risks that they're best situated to manage. And you're essentially obligating the government to purchase the resulting product. Um, firm fixed price is harder when you are trying to, you've got an unclear picture of, of the technology maturity, mm -hmm. uh, and you have an unclear picture of sort of future purchase patterns, those kinds of things, because then the contractor can't manage that risk. I think of firm fixed price as essentially you're buying insurance. You're buying insurance that the final product will cost you this much. Mm -hmm. And for someone to sell you that insurance premium, they need to know enough to essentially place the bet on their side. And it's hard to get a company to sign on to um, an insurance premium like that in an environment where they don't know the risk, or if the technology is not mature. Technology doesn't mature 
on a timeline that is known in many cases, especially when you're dealing with some of the aspirational sorts of uh, leapfrog technologies that DOD is often pursuing. Those are very tough to get anybody to sign on for firm fixed price. But where it's a mature technology, as much of the KC-46 was at the time, that seemed like something, hey, the contractor can manage this. They, they were willing to sign on to it. I, I, I think it, firm fixed price, in my view, from the work that we've done, is a tool that you need to take, um, take a moment and think about, does this apply best in this circumstance? It's not something you ought to pursue in every case. Yeah, so I, I still go back to my, my lessons as learning the KC-46 when I was at Scott as a, in charge of requirements. You know, it was an 85% commercial off-the-shelf available 7672C derivative with 787, and then 15% of that was developmental because it had never been done before. It was built to military specs. And so when you go back and you look at that, a firm fixed price, when I was on the Air Force side, that was great. You know, I, you know because it held the accountability in, in making you sure that you say what you're going to do when you can do it. Uh, but the challenge is when it's a developmental construct or, as you said, when technology and maturity is happening, right, when they built, my, my words, um, I, when I was at Scotty say they built the, 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 um, the RVS with uh, iPhone 1. And at the time, an iPhone 1 was the greatest state-of-the-art camera. You loved it compared to your flip phone. But at the time, they were building, you know, we're getting to, your GA report's very helpful, by the way, because um, it helped us identify where do we need to focus. But when you get to the iPhone 10, you know, every time there's a new leap in technology, you want more. And, and, you know, so I would say when you write that requirement for an iPhone 1, but then an iPhone 10 becomes available, there's that, you know, how do you hold accountable to what that requirement really is? And it might have changed. You might not, your, your wants and your needs might not be the same as when you started that journey. And that's where you get into some of those challenges because technology, you can get more and you might even be able to get it cheaper at times. I do, I do want to um, maybe push back just a little bit on the, the analogy, because I think when they wrote that contract, and by they, I mean you. Yeah. <laughs> but um, us. <laughs> in, in some sense, they wrote that you needed to be able to refuel in all lighting conditions. And I, I, this has been a little bit since I've, um, I was involved in yeah. that specific report, Fair. but I remember Fair. that that was sort of the feature. And the camera images that I saw when they were doing some of the initial deployment uh, testing was akin to your backup camera on your car, when you're backing out of your garage, you get that sudden change in ambient lighting and it washed everything out right. under some lighting conditions. And it could also happen from other sort of circumstances in the environment. And so I think what, what they ended up doing, that the contract was written broad enough, but the realization was once they deployed it and put it on an aircraft, they realized stereoscopic yeah. vision Absolutely. that human beings are just accustomed to and our, you know, we don't think much of, but it is quintessentially the way that we get um, depth perception. Yep. And the placement of those cameras and the visualization that each camera provides and then the software where it's pulled together into a screen, that was hard. It was that integration of technology. I don't think that the contract specified you had to have this specific camera, but it had the sort of more generic clause that you had to be able to refuel in all lighting conditions and as we get to the 2022 report, I think we'll, we'll get into this conversation about Air Force didn't want to go to court, I think, and uh, have the discussion with Boeing because there was disagreement on how that clause really applied. And so we'll never know how the court would have ruled. But I think it was, it was a, uh, I thought that the, the, from my perspective, that having that broad clause gave them at least a hook that they could hold on to and not be stuck with the technology they just said, hey, we need to be able to see well enough to refuel. JJ, right. so you're itching to get in, please. Yeah. Well, just to be fair, these looked like candidates, very good candidates for firm fixed price yeah. because yeah. there had been 767 be tankers built. They, had, they were nowhere near as sophisticated. They did not include a remote vision system, that the RVS that we're talking about. There had been Airbus 330 tankers built, the competitor that lost. So there was reason to believe that this was not a technologically significant leap. And it turned out the tail wagged the dog. The 15% right. that was developmental yeah. wound up driving the costs over the 85% that weren't developmental. Mm -hmm. Well put. 
Um, John, what are some of the insights from the 2022 report you've, you've referenced um, that focused on the remote vision system 2.0 uh, and then I think lessons for managing that now as we still plan on fielding RVS 2.0 sometime in the 2025-ish uh, period, uh, but then also think about next generation air refueling systems. So I think we wanna get into that discussion shortly, but more broadly, what, what are, how do we think about technology uh, managing technology, technological risk and development and maturation of it. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot in the 2022 report that maybe I don't know that we necessarily need to talk to. I think the other, the, my other two colleagues have gotten into it. The tail end of that report is about sort of um, how Air Force is going to meet its tanker requirement for 479 aircraft being available. Uh, very useful, the transition out of the KC-10 into the partially capable KC-46 and fully capable KC-46s, at least as they postulate technology being matured and being installed. But the, the, the RVS story that you're pointing to is about, uh, and I'll just reprise sort of the 2019 to the 2022 jump. In 2019, they thought they were gonna be able to solve this with maybe all software, which Every time somebody says it's just software, usually that's the beginning of a bad story because it's never just software and software is never just easy. Uh, but nonetheless, I think what they realized from in the window between our 19 report and the 2022 report was this was gonna have to be a, a fundamental revisit of the way that they conceptualized the RBS system. Mm -hmm. So it was gonna be new cameras, new monitors, yep. uh, and new software and um, specialized uh, even for the individual operator, there's gonna be some customization. Again, back to the, uh, the nuances of stereoscopic vision that was a journey of discovery here. And I think what, what, what we were um, disappointed to find was that in, I believe it was about April 2020, um, the Air Force entered into a, a, memorandum of, a memorandum of understanding with Boeing to take responsibility for the development of RVS, and that, from our perspective, was a walk away from the contractual provisions of holding the contractor accountable for executing delivery of what was contracted for, which was this um, uh, remote viewing system that could support refueling in all lighting conditions. And they agreed to take on that responsibility. Uh, it was already written by the time we'd started the work. There was some execution elements that had to be uh, worked through uh, in terms of uh, sort of the, the preliminary design review uh, process of the RVS reaching a certain technology level. That was met when Boeing uh, delivered a, uh, a briefing that described the system that they had postulated in Air Force, uh, got Boeing's estimate of technology maturity and its uh, technology maturation plan. And that process was sort of marked out. From our perspective, once Air Force took that responsibility for the financial obligations uh, that this was going to be uh, either take longer or cost more, usually those two go together, um, what was that Air Force really needed to stay, take a step back to what the sort of GAO leading practices, which are get an independent technology readiness assessment, get a technology maturation plan, and to prototype it on an actual air vehicle before you buy in to take on that financial responsibility, or in the case that they've already had that entered into this MOU, that they are able to at least present that to Congress so that this information can be built into the budgets as time goes forward and with an understanding that while you have to go through um, the budget process and come up with the five-year uh, plan for the FIDIP, when, you, when you're trying to put a dollar figure on a technology development effort, that is not uh, that's not science, mm -hmm. right? It's not, a, it's not, you know, this year it's gonna cost us this. There's a, there's a probability based on uh, the technology maturing on the, along the plan. So from our perspective, we recommended that those three things be done in order to make sure that the Air Force, the Department of Defense, and, the, and ultimately the Congress uh, and the President can agree that, hey, we understand the, the circumstance here, we understand what we think it's gonna cost, but we understand what the probability is of, the, of that cost, sort of working out to be different. So that's sort of where the 2022 report came out. From our, from our perspective, now that you took on this responsibility, you, it became really important to make sure you knew what you were getting into, because from, as, as you look forward, and I think the, it's been a little while 
thank you for inviting me here because it gave me the chance to go back and, and review that report and in particular to look at the, uh, the agency comments because at the end of a GAO report, we send the draft over to the department, the department gets to tell us what they think about it, and then we write about what they think about it. So as I say, we write last. But um, the agency comments, essentially there were a lot of them, but the Air Force found that uh, they wanted to deliver this capability faster than they thought they could do if they followed our recommendations, so they disagreed with them. There's the details, I invite everybody to look at the report, but the, the challenge is when you're in a hurry, it's even more important that you not make a mistake. So from our perspective, it's a measure twice and cut once situation that you, if you get an independent technology readiness assessment, that you uh, get a maturation plan that you think makes sense from an uh, independent perspective, and then you prototype it, then you know what you're in for, and you can better predict the outcome in terms of cost, schedule, and delivery to the warfighter of the actual capability they think they're gonna get. So I just wanted to go back to the, my iPhone 1, iPhone yep. 10 example. You know, the 1.0, RVS 1.0, uh, I got to deliver a KC-46, so I got to spend time with them as they showed it to me before I delivered it. 1.0 was where they noticed they had some human performance wing and some of the other professionals came in and documented where they had some challenges. 1.5 was another version that they were trying to um, use and then they ended up with 2.0, which haven't seen it, it looks pretty amazing and what it can and can't do. And, you know, haven't spent a lot of time in, in back in the boom pod watching uh, my uh, boom operators refuel. Even the Mark I eyeball, you don't refuel in all weather. Even that you have sometimes based on clouds and weather and sunspots and stuff like that. So in what you do in those cases, you just do it to prudence is, hey, hold your position. And so, you know, but I think that the evolution between the 1.0 and the 1.5 and then the 2.0, I think that they've gotten at least provided that it comes out and delivers on time and on schedule, it, it's really where they needed to be. And just one last thing, some good news, this is our, today is our 100 year anniversary that the department has celebrating that we've conducted air refueling on June 27th in 1923. So that was the first time the Army Air Corps provided some air refueling back in 1923. Cool. So 100 years good today. Right. Good, 100 years. Good, good timing good for the timing. show. Well played. Yeah. Um, Thinking about 100 years and, and, and the evolution of the enterprise, uh, one of the things I guess that's significantly changed in the past couple decades is the threat environment. The reality is aerial refueling is now under a uh, significant threat and General uh, Chief Staff of the Air Force, General Brown, has called on the service to accelerate change or lose. Um, and, and the Air Mobility Commander, General Minahan, um, has now urged um, his command and, and set some objectives to greatly improve the, the performance of the force in, in a near term time frame, mostly I think focused on tactics, techniques, to, and procedures improvements, mm -hmm. um, and then thinking about material improvements. Um, Tom, starting with you perhaps, what do you think are some of the changes in, in the operating environment or other changes? Um, so for instance, right now we're facing, I guess, competing budget priorities, maybe a flat fiscal year 2024 budget or a, a cut in terms of real terms. Um, that will force some of these changes and uh, needs to prioritize within the service. So I, I mean, that, that's a great question. I think that's the the, the golden the golden question there. Um, you know, just look at the history of air refueling. You know, we started doing pre and post strike with bombers. You know, for the for the nuclear plans, and then we started Vietnam. Did a little bit of fighter drags, not much. We did tanker bridges. We've done all these other things. But I think that in today's environment as General Brown has articulated, change now or lose because the threat environment has changed. You know, we used to, you know, there, there are near-peer adversaries that have, you know, some would say either have caught us or are catching us in some of the capabilities they provide. You know, this A2AD environment is, as soon as you're in your cockpit, you're in an A2AD environment, you know, because of the way that uh, the, the threat is today. And so I think that with the tanker specifically, we have to decide what role do we want the tanker going into the end gas and the family of systems that they're looking at for the RFI, what capabilities do we want this tanker to have? Is it to go close to the weapon engagement zone? Is it to do pre and post strike? Is it to have big offloads? Is it to be a tactical offload? Is it to go to small airfields? Is it to be a big tanker that has big offloads with big standoff? Or do we want it to be a stealthy tanker that some there's been discussions on, does it take it into that weapon engagement zone close to the target as it can get? Mm -hmm. And that's, a, you know, those are all competing <coughs> interests. And then you got to realize, is it affordable? And that's a decision that's in part being forced by our adversaries. 
Right. It used to be you could set up tanker racetracks outside the range of the enemy's fire, mm -hmm. fuel the combat aircraft. The combat aircraft would do the ingress to the target, but the tankers would be relatively immune where they were. As uh, our adversaries have developed longer and longer range air defense systems, air to air missile systems, now you can't park the tankers far enough away that they are immune. So then you get driven to this series of decisions. Do you try to make them invisible? Do you just completely change their role so they're not sitting out there running racetracks but are accompanying the strike packages inbound? Mm -hmm. Or what should it look like? The Air Force is asking these questions, but in some ways they're being forced to ask these questions. But, but it also, as you, as you start to think about a stealth tanker, that's not gonna be a, a commercial derivative in, in lots of circumstances, right? I mean, the, the design of a stealth aircraft is gonna be specific to uh, minimize your radar signature, and it's not just you know, spray paint the 767. It, could, it may be a, a wholly new vehicle in order to be able to deliver that kind of capability. With a little bit of an asterisk on it in that industry is now looking at very different designs for commercial aircraft that look much more like stealth aircraft, specifically right. blended wing body designs, yep. where there could be some commonality between the next generation uh, airliner and tanker. But I think, I think the point- But it point, works the other way. The tanker would come first. Sure, sure. I, and, and DOD has been, has had a long history of um, developing technologies that find their way into commercial platforms, you know, really decades. DOD has been a technology driver. But I, I do think that this idea that the, because, you know, when you think about this transition from standing up in a Afghanistan and Iraq um, versus trying to uh, think about what the world looks like in a, in a conflict with a, a Russia or a China, they're just wholly different situations as it relates to the tanker. The idea that the general brought up that the, uh, the, the Chinese and, and the Russians have considerable uh, capabilities in terms of seeing and shooting uh, aircraft. And so we need to think about, as I think we've, we've talked, the idea that you used to be able to uh, hang out, refuel fighters or bombers or whatever, and then they could ingress. That's, you just can't get far enough away. And, and uh, a lot of the capabilities of the advanced aircraft are they just need, they need gas in order to be able to do their job, and, and that distance is, is something that has to be calculated and figure out how do we make this work. So you, can, you, you, nece you can't necessarily uh, post up a 767 outside of uh, whatever you're trying to do outside that zone. Yeah, so I, I, I articulate it this way. You know, we're, we're a global power, and we're a global power because we have the ability to hold any target at risk at a time and place of our choosing anywhere in the globe, and that is because we have air refueling assets and we have the strike assets and, and other platforms that allow that to happen. The question is, as this threat evolves and as the world changes and spectrum becomes as important as gas, how do we, and data, how do we build the next generation air refueling platform that allows us to have those capabilities that get us to where we need so we can continue to have that any target at risk anywhere in the globe at a time and place of our choosing? And how do we do that and what kind of capabilities do we do to ensure that we have across the fleets, but specifically also in the, one, in, the, in the tanker fleet that allows it to do more than just give gas. You know, there's gotta be data, there's gotta be, there's gotta be, you know, ELINT, all those other things that self-protect, the sharing of information, that command and control, all those things that we do in stovepipes, how do we start looking at building platforms that are connected, as, as General Goldfin used to say, protected, connected, defended, and synced. Yeah. How do we do that in this environment? And I think this, the RFI that came out for the next generation of fueling system, allows us to think about what would this purpose-built tanker be? You know, I mean, you, you look out there, there's not many tanker platforms out there that are not different than what they were back when we built the 135. I mean, with the exception maybe the MQ-25 and some of the other airplanes that are coming out there where they're different. And they're getting into that pushing the envelope of manned, unmanned, teaming concepts. Those are the type of things that as we look at this purpose-built tanker, which I think KCZ should be, what are those things that we, th that the warfighter needs to ensure that we can be successful, not only today, but into the foreseeable future. I, I do think that the, the issue of the, the rise of unmanned vehicles is part of this story, right? Absolutely. So the idea of KCZ as a technology evolution is, is an interesting one because you've got the, the attack platforms uh, are 
you know, able of being unmanned at this point, and you've also got maybe the KCZ has some capability to be either lightly manned or unmanned, and those, those capabilities give you uh, the opportunity to protect the pilot, and uh, while it's unfortunate to lose aircraft, we don't want to lose pilots. I used to say optionally manned, right, because it gives you the ability to get to unmanned, but I think some of the policies and you know, challenges we'd have to do it today, we'd have to prove that confidence That's to right. be able to get to that so that the policies were in effect so that you could operate in that airspace and have freedom of maneuver and access and overflights that right now you may or may not have if you went straight to that unmanned. And I think the, the, the concept of an uncrewed, uncrewed araft, but maybe still with right. um, a, a human in the loop Absolutely. in terms of fire yep. control and those kinds of issues, those are, those are distinct uh, paths, in fact, some opportunities to sort of think about how technology evolves and the opportunities to deploy increments of that technology evolution, as opposed to uh, what sometimes doesn't end well for DOD, which is this, we want to dream this, uh, of this amazing technology, but then we don't deploy it sort of incrementally. We end up signing on for a program that- Pentagon ends up Wars, being, Pentagon <laughs> Wars. Ends up being over cost, over, uh, over schedule, and- And you deliver obsolescence, you deliver obsolescence. And autonomy is a different policy question for the tanker than it is sure. for other aircraft yeah, sure. because it doesn't have weapons release. Right. So you could have a fully autonomous refueling platform that is capable of going into well-defended areas. You care much less about whether you lose it without getting into some of the questions that bedevil the discussion of attack platforms that are autonomous. Sure. Yeah. I think it's also worth pointing out that many of the, the capabilities that, that all of us have, have discussed right now over the past few minutes are ones that we would likely want to have in the current and program force, right, if possible. We want to have more survivability in our KC-135s, KC-46s that we're going to have well out into the 2040s. So I think it's, it's important to talk about NGAS, but NGAS is hopefully a capability we can field in the first half of the 2030s. We will need to start to have NGAS capabilities <laughs> In the, in the current tankers, right, in terms of improved survivability, in terms of improved uh, low probability of intercept and detection data links, in terms of better command and control capabilities. And unless we mature those now, it's gonna be a really tough leap to just drop in, drop it all into the end gas in the future. Sure, but to a certain extent, there you get into a classic congressional debate, which is, <laughs> yeah. what is the balance between spending money to improve what we already have versus investing in something new? If it's going to cost you 75% of a new program to just to improve what you already have, why bother spending that and instead move to the new program? Mm -hmm. The problem, of course, is you never know if it's going to be 75 or 15 or 44 until you're well into the program. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, I, I think that I say that it's very relevant in the DOD space today, family of systems, right? We have to have those family of systems that have that compatibility, that architecture, that ability to share information, um, it, you know, across that spectrum of conflict. And I think as we look to the tanker fleet, you know, we don't want to have the have and the have nots. There may be a time when you have to because you can't afford mm -hmm. to backcast that technology, but I think you got to bring them along so that they can be relevant in that family of systems because that's how we're going to be able to win this you know, maintain our relevance and then and, and maintain that combat edge going forward in the future. Sharing of information, sharing of data, and, and putting, you know, um, uh, our tankers and our strike assets where we need to be. And I, I think we've, we've obviously made the pivot, as you were suggesting we would, into sort of future systems, and GAO hasn't done uh, uh, analysis of, of the, the follow-ons to the KC-46, so I can't speak to those, but what I can say is, from our perspective, when you think of these sort of leapfrog technologies, the, the road divides in the yellow wood, right? You, you can either do that and post up a uh, program of record, and there's a variety of different ways to do that now. Obviously, there's some flexibilities. Or you can go down an s and path, mature technologies, and then drop those technologies when they're mature onto uh, programs of record that, that exist or, or that you want to post up later on. And from our perspective, when you look at sort of the history of DOD, what we've found is that when you start programs of record with immature technologies, you end up with less reliable estimates for cost and schedule and uh, for ultimately delivering that uh, capability to the warfighter. Uh, so you end up with shortfalls in, in delivery of capability. So as, as everybody considers this path forward, Congress and, and uh, the, the Department of Defense, 
it's important to make sure that you're funding that technology maturation pipeline so that you can get those break leapfrog technologies right. ready for when you are going to try to post them onto a program of record. And that can be a small, maybe it's a small tanker yep. for, with specific capability, or a large tanker, obviously harder to make a big thing uh, look small on a radar. But uh, you know those capabilities, those choices are uh, more available if you make sure you're funding that S&T R&D pipeline. And some proof of that can be seen, it's not a tanker program, but in the B-21, which right now is acclaimed as one of the better functioning programs in the military. And a fundamental decision at the beginning of that program was to accept no subsystem onto the aircraft that wasn't already at technology readiness level seven or above. So pace the development to available, reliable yeah. technology rather than pushing beyond the edge. That's well put. Um, and, and I think a great transition for, for maybe you're thinking about um, what comes next. Uh, right now, uh, Congress is uh, finished the, both the Senate and the House finished their marks of the fiscal year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act. Mm -hmm. The House mark did have a number of provisions, related, sections related to uh, aerial refueling. One of which, in some respects, I think pumped the brakes on the Air Force's plan for buying an additional 75 more KC-46 and accelerating next generation air refueling system. Um, as you take a look at this plan, I think what are elements to for the, I think for Air Force, for Congress to consider uh, regarding opportunities, factors they should keep in mind as they think about acquisition strategy and contracting forward? Well, part of what they're trying to do is shorten the length of the bridge that the bridge tanker re represents from one generation to the next. The problem with that is that you're trying essentially to legislate how fast technology can be developed, where, how fast you get to that next tanker. And the faster you get to it, maybe the fewer bridge tankers you need. But unfortunately, technology uh, does not respond to legislation. It is independent of the will of the Congress and often the will of its developers. It comes along when it's ready. So that's not a variable that can be controlled by passing the Defense Authorization Act. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just look at, you know, we can't, we can't afford to have a gap. You know, if we take that gap and go out, um, and then we talk about four different refueling systems, right? For, I looked at it as, um, you know, as a recovering programmer, you know, when I look at all the cost of infrastructure, MILCON, of, of bringing on training systems, I mean, for me, for the KC-46, just doing the parts catalyzation from the civilian into the military, um, doing the maintenance training, I mean, all of those things and certificate was a huge, huge, and it took longer than we thought. I mean, you know, and so if we're talking 2033 or 2034 right now, you know, we gotta make a decision because the longer we wait, those things aren't going to happen, and Milcon hasn't been quick to get through um, this side of the river. So there's just a lot of challenges that, you know, and so I hope that we can do this in a pro pragmatic way of, of getting the requirements defined sooner and then determining when we're going to do that. And if we can get to Z as fast as we can get to Z, I think we, that's a, an urgent thing that we need to figure out quickly. Sure. But even if we get to Z as fast as we can get to Z, typical programs are taking more than 20 years oh, absolutely. from clean sheet yes. of paper. So that there's still going to be, need to be a substantial bridge between the end of KC-46 and whenever Z comes along. Yes. With some ability to dial it up and down if the technology actually does accelerate. And I think 75 additional KC-46 is probably like an aggressive target. There's always the option of if it could be 75 and then you add another 12, 15 for every year, additional year, year, year you need um, more before you can transition. Um, our colleague Nadia Shablo published, a, I think, a brilliant essay in The Atlantic uh, titled The Forgotten Element of Strategy. I'd recommend it to everyone. Um, and one of the great points she made is that many times policymakers don't focus enough on the timing of a strategy. And in, in particular, the timing when a capability or a proposal will be implemented. Timing when you start something is, is easier to define. When it's actually gonna be implemented or have enough of an impact is significant, and um, I think her essay, relevant to our discussion today, highlighted for me that one of the challenges is, I think, the discussion of what that KCY or, KC, or bridge tanker or additional KCX, however we want to characterize it, is now becoming contemporaneous with the discussion of NGAS or KCZ in terms of the delivery timeline. So that timing discussion is one in which um, 
I think DOD and Congress will increasingly have a choice of, do we want to spend our funds on on a transition tanker, or more of a transition tanker, or NGAS, um, and won't want to have there be a drop. Right, but that transition tanker at 75 aircraft, that's five years production yes. at the current rate for KC-46. That doesn't buy you a very long bridge. Right. And in five years, how much development is there going to be? There's, it still appears that there would be a gap at that number. Well, and, and you did, one of the things that we do highlight in, in the 22 report is there was a push out of some, some of the tankers uh, into later years from earlier years mm -hmm. because of the, the sort of late blooming um, RVS system and some of, the other, some of the other aspects. And I think that's important, an important consideration when you think about the overall health of the tanker fleet. Obviously, KC-10s um, get pulled offline in the next year or so, uh, and you're gonna have partially capable KC-46s that are gonna fill some of the gaps but have some limitations. And eventually, I think in, it's now 2029, 2030, they're gonna be all the fully capable KC-46s if all goes well and the creeks don't rise, um, would, be, would be fielded. So this, the 75 additional tankers, presumably at a lower cost to the government because there's no technology development uh, and the, the next increment ought to be cheaper than the last increment, but I'm just speaking as a taxpayer. Uh, yeah. not just, we haven't done any work at GAO to examine that question, but. Um, I think that that's a, it's an opportunity, but it comes down to this question of strategy. Does do more KC-46s meet your need? How does that look with the aging of the 135 fleet? Because some of those are getting rather long in the tooth uh, at this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, partial capable. I think General Minhan's declared them mission capable with all except for the, for the A-10. I think if that's correct, my yes. memory serves me. So I, you know, I, and I know that they're gonna have to go back and fix some of those, but I, I go back to the, the challenge that we have, right? We have 300 KC-135s, and the plan was for four, 179 KC-46s, and, and there's been some back and forth of what those overall tanker numbers are, because I think that's some of the trade space and some of the capabilities that, that the Air Force is in, in, and the department is, is struggling with. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we gotta realize, we gotta continue to replace those 135s because you know, they're built 56, maybe up to 62. And, and they're not getting any younger. And you know, it was old when, you know, the late 80s when I started flying them. Um, and you know, they've done an amazing job. I wanna just shout out to the maintainers and the crews that fly the KC-135s. They're amazing and they do a great, a great job. Um, but we gotta figure out how do we shorten that bridge? Mm -hmm. And what is that number and how long? Because as you said, if it's a clean sheet, and it's the traditional way of 2025. I think they've done some, there's been some discussions about how to accelerate some of those things. You there's know, There's flexibilities in how you acquire. Now, right, that right. Maybe you can shorten some of this if, if it's easier. If it's harder, it's gonna be hard, right? right. That's how it works. But, but I just go back, we got those 300, we gotta figure out how do we replace them? Because uh, you know, if they're flying beyond 2040, 2050, you know, they're, 100 year, they're, they're approaching 100 years old. And specifically, I think on the, on the bridge tanker KCY competition, right, deferring a selection yeah. of either between the KC-46 or LMXT, I think counterintuitively probably doesn't actually help the government in many ways, right, because it puts um, uh, Lockheed in a situation and Lockheed and Airbus in a situation where it'll be probably increasingly challenging for them to have a, a nice transition from the A330 line in Europe to a LMXT line here in the United States. It makes it also, I think, where Boeing will likely have increasing leverage Right, because as the lot 13 contract award won't happen until 2026 or 2027, so right. Boeing will have increasing leverage because they know LMXT won't be a viable option and, and will be able to, I think, increase the price on, on what they're gonna offer for that KC-46. And then ultimately it doesn't provide you know, greater stability and probably will have some perturbations on how many KC-46 we could field to, um, to replace the KC-135. So, the Air Force, I think, should make a decision. It probably knows enough about both the LMXT and KC-46 to make a decision now and start to move forward. I think it's right, though, for Congress to exercise appropriate levels of oversight and encourage that NGAS analysis of alternatives to be a robust one. Measure twice, cut once, as, as you said, John. Right. Yeah, well, I, think, I think as you think of it, the, the clean sheet program, uh, GAO's, uh, lessons that you can, uh, you can pull from, sort of those leading practices, that those are great tools that I would encourage the department to, to look at. And I do think that 
One thing that, that everyone needs to sort of keep in mind when you're making these decisions is the future is not necessarily just like the past. So you, whatever, whatever your tanker fleet of the future is should be set for that future fight, uh, not necessarily to you know, post up for the, the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, whatever that fight was, right? So yeah. the capabilities of that future fleet are really what you need to be thinking about because this is your opportunity because you are modernizing that fleet, right? right now with that, especially if you do the 75 additional tanks. If I could real quick, you know, Mobility Guardian that, that Air Mobility Command's doing this summer is gonna test a lot of those capabilities in that environment that we're talking about. And it's gonna be the most robust exercise that they've done forward in, in, in probably in recent memory. And they're gonna stress uh, all of those things that the Secretary Kendall and his, and his operational imperatives, but the tanker is gonna be a center part of that um, uh, orchestration of that exercise. So that'll be great feedback to do exactly what you were talking about. I did, I did wanna, I'm sorry, I, I did wanna highlight one thing that, that I thought the Air Force also did, did well that we highlighted in the 2022 report is there's, a, there's often been this discussion about how much tanking do we need? Yeah. Um, and is it 30,000 hours or whatever the number is? What we found is there wasn't a real strong basis for all the numbers that are being thrown around because they don't really, the Air Force hadn't really been tracking demand for tankers in a way that made a lot of sense because I think from the user community, they were told there wasn't tanking available for um, some training missions or in some parts of the country or you know weekends or Thursdays or whatever the, the, the issue was, so they didn't ask for it. So they weren't tracking the demand. And they did, uh, during the course of our, our report, uh, notify us, let us know that they, they were developing a database to better track sort of demand, mm -hmm. which would give you that picture of Hey, how how much can we act? How much how much tanking demand do we actually need? How many tankers do we actually need in order to satisfy? Because if you say you're you're doing doing some training uh, flying, if you can tank and stay airborne and continue practice mission, um, that's more efficient than needing to go yeah. land, refuel, and take off and get back on station. Whether you know you're out at test and training range or whatever. So I think understanding that demand for tanking on the, the blue sky day is pretty important because it helps you decide how many tankers you actually need. Congress asks four press questions of new programs. What does it do? What does it cost? Where is it built? Where is it based? Depending upon which member of Congress you are, the sequence of those questions changes. Yes. The members of the Armed Services Committees will most often ask the first one. The appropriators will ask the second one. The other members of Congress, the vast bulk of them, only care about the final two. So where is it built, where is it based, winds up driving much more than any strategy we've talked about, the decision that you're going to actually see come out of Congress. Well, it's a perfect way for us, I think, to, to end. Uh, it's been a rich conversation. Uh, one that I'm certain is going to continue as Congress reviews the 24 uh, National Defense Authorization Act and as the next generation air refueling system, AOA, prepares to kick off this fall. So thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to continuing the conversation.